On behalf of the White House Initiative on Historical Black Colleges and Universities, the Small Business Administration, and the White House itself, we welcome you to this summit. I am John Brown, and I have the pleasure of working in the White House Initiative on HBCUs, but I am not John Wilson, who is the Executive Director of this office. He, unfortunately, is at a meeting up in Bethesda at the National Institutes of Health and sends his regrets for not being able to join us, at least at this stage. He's going to make an earnest effort to join us later this afternoon, but he sends his regards and best wishes, and he hopes that, of course, we will have a meaningful and productive session this afternoon. Um, I also know very much so that I am not the star of this event, and so I'm going to keep my comments very, very brief And before we welcome our uh, next speaker, Warren Ballantyne. I do want to say, however, that oftentimes when, when the notion of historically black colleges and universities is thought of, we are thought about in terms of what we do with students and what we do from a faculty perspective. But we're also economic engines, both of change and productivity. And I just want to give you one example, and that's the University of Maryland at Eastern Shore. Uh, in the past 15 years, the University of Maryland at Eastern Shore has invested in, helped support, created, and uh, enabled numerous organizations and companies to come into existence. In fact, that number approaches uh, well over 100. And the number of jobs that they have created during that 15-year period approaches 6,000. If you think about where the University of Maryland Eastern Shore is even located on the Eastern Shore of the state, that is a phenomenal accomplishment. And one of the things that we hope will come out of the sessions and the discussions that will take place is a deeper appreciation for the impact and the potential that HBCUs have. And we believe the collaboration, that much of which has been led by Marie Johns at the SBA, that will take place today and we hope in the coming weeks and months will help to replicate the University of Maryland's accomplishments at other institutions, at other HBCUs around the country. We hope we will also use this opportunity to get to know one another to build on your own relationships and to leverage those once you leave the premises. Again, thank you for your time. We apologize for those of you who may have had a glitch in getting through the security clearance, but we are most happy and delightful that you're here with us. Warren? Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I am so happy to be here uh, to participate and moderate this wonderful panel. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time up here talking because I know it's a lot of uh, people who are a lot more smarter than me uh, who's about to be on this panel to teach us about entrepreneurship, especially in underdeserving uh, communities. Uh, I, I just want to thank the SBA. I want to thank uh, the Historically Black Colleges that's participating. I'd also like to thank this administration for caring enough to talk about the need of entrepreneurship in uh, underdeserving communities and in impoverished communities throughout this country. So with that being said, uh, let me bring on the Deputy Administrator of the United States Small Business, Miss Marie Johns. Thank you, Warren, and thank you for your support over uh, the last two years in spreading the word about entrepreneurship and what we're doing at the SBA to better serve underserved markets throughout our, our country. And I also want to thank John uh, Brown. His office has been a great partner in pulling together today's event, along with uh, Leonard Haynes from the Department of Education and uh, Deborah Saunders White, the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary, who we were on the radio with Warren earlier today talking about today's forum. This is going to be live stream, and so people are going to uh, log into whitehouse.gov and be able to participate in the proceedings uh, through the internet. I also want to thank my colleagues at the SBA, Michael Chodos and uh, Ellen, and um, uh, Ellen Thrasher, Chris James, Aaron Andrew, uh, those from our Office of Entrepreneurial Development who have worked so hard to put everything together today. And today's event is a partnership between the White House, the SBA, the Department of Education to build awareness and to increase entrepreneurial services on your campuses. 
I mean, Warren uh, and John both alluded to it in, in their comments, and that is that we know we have all the creativity, all the energy on our campuses to really spark that next generation of business leaders, small business leaders, and we want to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place to support these great young minds. So today's summit really grew out of a series of conversations that we've been having between the SBA, the Department of Education, and with many of you in this room to talk about how we as an agency can, can better serve your efforts. And so I want to thank you so much for being here. I know many of you travel from great distances and you're very busy people. And so it means so much to have you here today and to be able to benefit from your thinking on these very important issues. Anybody who, who uh, talks to me for just a few minutes knows uh, that I'm a big fan of our historically black colleges and universities and our minority serving institutions. They, they play such an important role in the educational landscape for our young people. And in fact, I've had the honor of serving on the board of Howard University for a number of years. And I've, I believe strongly in what your institutions mean for us in our future as a nation. And I also firmly believe that you have to be at the center of our entrepreneurial ecosystem in this country. So whether it's students designing the next big tech startup from their dorm room or filling a niche by uh, creating a successful services business, entrepreneurship and innovation is actually occurring in every one of your institutions. And we know it's not just business majors. There are businesses that can be created from research, from across the academy, uh, in areas like agriculture and food science, computer labs, design studios, uh, engineering programs, and the like. And our job at the SBA and across the administration is to ensure that those innovative ideas and that that entrepreneurial spirit can be harnessed and then transformed into successful businesses. So it's about getting young people excited about opportunities and entrepreneurship and to make sure that they get the counseling and the mentoring and the other supports that they need to get their businesses up and running. That's what our panels will focus on later uh, in this afternoon. And at the SBA, we work closely with HBCUs and other minority serving inst uh, institutions through our small business development network. We have 17 of our small business development centers located in HBCUs across the country. And we're also, through our Office of Native American Affairs, working closely with tribal colleges. Uh, and we're, through our Office of Entrepreneurial Development, we have ongoing outreach to underserved communities through programs such as our E200 initiative, um, which is hosted at San Juan College in Farmington, New Mexico. We have a vast business development network of our SCORE counselors, our women's business centers around the country. And those resource partners are really the feet and the, the hands and the minds on the street that are serving over one million entrepreneurs every year. And they're providing the nurture for the entrepreneurial activity and the technical skills that will help us create more small businesses and create more jobs. And the best part about it is those resources are free. So I want to tell you about one person we work with, a young man by the name of Kevin Jefferson. Kevin started his, own, started his own marketing and digital outreach business while he was still in high school. And he clearly caught the entrepreneurial bug very early. He went on to build his business while a student at Morehouse College. And to help grow his company, he attended a joint workshop hosted by the SBA and the, Atl and the Atlanta Microlending Fund. Today, he's in the process of applying for the SBA 8A Business Development Program. And so if you ask Kevin, he credits much of his success to the counseling that he received from the SBA. And he continues to use our online resources to grow his company. The fact of the matter is your campuses are teeming with Kevin's. And we want to make sure that we reach each and every one of them. One of the great things about the SBA is that we get to work with companies no matter what stage of development they are. So we have we talked about Kevin, who's just starting his business. I'd like to say just a word about another person who uh, is in the room and will be on a panel later, who I think is a tremendous example of a more mature success, and that's Deborah Scott Thomas. Deborah's a graduate of Alabama State University. She's a, um, an esteemed veteran. She served in the Air Force, and she's built a very impressive business, Data Solutions and Technology Incorporated, or DST. Deborah's company has grown to over 200 employees. They sell to many government agencies, including the US Army, the Marines, the Department of Energy, and the Treasury. And this is a win-win. Deborah gets access to an important revenue stream, and these government agencies get the benefit of working with a great company like Deborah's. 
So at the SBA, part of what we do is to help manage the federal government supply chain for small businesses like Deborah's to take advantage of uh, those opportunities. One of my favorite parts of this job is to be able to travel around the country and to meet young entrepreneurs from all over. And one of the favorite uh, initiatives that I have been a part of launching at the SBA is our Young Entrepreneurship Series. And we held events around the country, including at Johnson C. Smith University. And there was one thing that was very clear, and that is we have some outstanding young business people out there, and we must work together to give them the support that they need to create their small businesses and to create the jobs that those businesses will, will offer. To better connect with our younger folks, though, the SBA is getting ready to expand uh, many of our offer offerings. For example, our digital applications is one good way to support young entrepreneurs. And it will help uh, young folks find a mentor, for example, or to find uh, access to get access to other resources that they need in order to support their business. And we're going to be rolling these out within the coming months. In addition, SBA and the Startup America Partnership have launched a series of regional accelerator and university events focused on helping high growth in, uh, entrepreneurs. Because we know that high growth entrepreneurs come from all parts of the country, all industries, and they're often in university settings just like your universities. So we want to work with you in these regional convenings and we'll discuss partnership opportunities and best practices a little later today. For example, our Small Business Innovation Research or SBIR program distributed over two and a half billion dollars last year to early stage innovative companies. One of, the, one of the explicit goals of the SBIR program is to increase the participation of minorities and women in technical innovation and entrepreneurship. And so we want to make sure that all of your institutions know about the SBIR and know how to connect to those resources. Our hope through today's forum is that we will begin the process of working together more closely to share information about the resources that we have in the federal government as well as the resources that you have in your institutions. And so I'm going to close with just a quick few points. We want to, our goal today is to make sure that more minority students can be full participants in the entrepreneurship community. We know that this will bring more economic opportunity, more innovation, and more good paying jobs to neighborhoods across the country. And we want to hear from you about how we make this possible. I know that you have tremendous ideas. We know that we don't have the monopoly on good ideas. So we, want to need, we need to know from you, what do your students need? What does your faculty need? How can we as, at the SBA, the Department of Ed, other federal agencies, how can we better support creating more of an entrepreneurial culture on your campuses? We want to know how to make it happen. And we want to know where should we go together from here. So again, I thank you so much for being a part of today's uh, historic conversation, actually, from the SBA's perspective. This is the first time we have been part of hosting such an August event. And I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be here. And I look forward to a very stimulating conversation. Thank you very much. All right, with no further ado, let's introduce this most esteemed panel to be talking about what we're going to be dealing with today. Uh, first up is the Director of Diversity, Workforce, and Small Business Development at Johnson C. Smith University, Mr. Ron Stodgill. <laughs> Next up is a good friend of mine. She's the president of Bennett College. And um, I know you have to move on, but I'm going to tell you again in public, I hate that you're leaving Bennett. Ms. Dr. Julian Melvo. Our next panelist is a professor of business strategy and urban entrepreneurship at Rutgers Business School, Dr. D.T. Ogilvie. Our next panelist is a president at one of our HBCUs of Mission College, Dr. Laurel Jones. And our next uh, panelist is a graduate of Morehouse College. I will not hold that against him. <laughs> He's the regional administrator uh, for the United States Small Business Administration, my brother, Cassius Butts. Well, I guess we'll start the panel off like this. 
All of you have been instrumental in development on your colleges, universities, and, and, and in, the, in the community about entrepreneurship. Let's talk about some of the things you've seen that is actually working in underprivileged communities or with young people on college campuses as far as entrepreneurship. And I guess uh, we'll start with you, uh, Ron. Well, thank you, Warren. Well, what's starting to happen in Charlotte is, is a, a conversation that grows out of um, a realization that um, it takes more than just our banking community to power the economy there. There was a meltdown um, in, in 07, and it really started this re that along with um, sort of serendipitously the arrival of Bob Johnson, sort of the, 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 the biggest black business person in America who came to Charlotte and, and didn't do as well as he thought he might. And on his way out, he had some sort of parting shots about our culture there and how sort of um, uninclusive it is. And it really started um, a painful conversation, frankly. And at the time, I was uh, working as a columnist and um, a business columnist and kind of, I guess, um, uh, agitated that conversation along. And um, it became uh, a really healthy one, frankly. And we're sort of the inflection point now um, where, where we're starting to create bridges uh, between the communities to, um, to bring a Johnson C. Smith, which is sort of located right in downtown Charlotte, frankly, um, with the Central Business District. And that kind of an apartheid exists if you to, to, were to come to Smith right now, where um, you can just really see the marginalized nature of that community. And, and, and through Dr. Carter, Ronald Carter, um, who sort of his his big initiative has been to to bridge that gap. Um, we're starting to have some great, great conversations. One of them sort of uh, in, uh, manifested, frankly, um, in in the summit um, um, that we had with the Department of Education and the SBA um, that Marie John spoke of earlier back in November. So now there's sort of this dialogue where people are feeling like, oh, we want to bring you your business, our business ideas. We want you to find, uh, help us find people to fund them or at least develop them. And so really this is embryonic. It's not going to happen overnight, but I think the right cultural conversation is happening. Dr. Malvo, let me ask you this. You get to cultivate young women every day at Bennett, the Bennett Bells. You've done such a great job since you've been there. What's the most important thing that you try to teach your students about entrepreneurship? I know you just had your first graduate to graduate with a minor of entrepreneurship. Why is it so important to teach entrepreneurship on the college level? Well, thank you, Warren, and thank you, Marie Johns, for bringing us together and all those who put this uh, meeting together. And of course, I bring you greetings from Bennett College for Women, the oasis where we educate and celebrate <laughs> women and develop them into 21st century leaders and global thinkers. Um, you, what I t tell my students all the time is you've got to have not only a plan A, but a plan B, C, D, and E. And the reason that entrepreneurship in that context is important is because the labor market is not generating the kind of opportunities that we'd like to see it generate. And so some, although entrepreneurship is not the final solution, it is going to be an option. Whether you're an arts major, a physics major, a journalist, or another kind of major, you will work for yourself at some point in your life. I can almost guarantee it. So as opposed to having a business, B-I-D-N-E-S-S, we want you to have a business. In other words, you know, I, I tell the students all the time, you're braiding hair. Well, are you braiding hair for recreation or are you braiding it for money? If you're braiding it for recreation, go on and charge your girlfriend $20 after you've been in her head for six hours. That, that means you put value your time at $2.50 an hour. If you're braiding it for money, at least charge your girlfriend $10 an hour, you know, more than the minimum wage, or you could be flipping burgers. You know, when I came to Bennett, we had four foci. In fact, uh, Brother Affleck, who was at, on the campus at the time, might remember that part of my interview. I said that there are four areas that we wanted to focus on, and in focusing on those areas, we would cover every young woman in the nation. Entrepreneurship, leadership, global studies, and communications. And I'm pleased to see that all those areas have seen significant growth in my tenure. Dr. Cynthia Clemens is here. She is our director of entrepreneurship. That is a position that was created in, but to stand up, Cynthia. Don't just wave your hand. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. Let's give her. And she has been the brains behind the development of this. We do several things, Warren. We have started, our, our entrepreneurial minor will graduate in May. 
And so we, we have a minor now. It has 18 hours. It has four tracks in social entrepreneurship and arts entrepreneurship in science and innovation and in business. And so we have had the opportunity for our students to intern. Some of them say, well, I don't ever want to be a business person. You have ideas. Patent your idea. Right. Don't just give it away. And that's what the whole entrepreneurial thing is about. One of the things that I was really pleased to be able to do um, is a summer entrepreneurship institute. Any of you who have children who are 13 to 17, girls, we don't let boys sleep on the campus. Um, we have young women who are 13 to 17. It's a high school program. It's a 10-day residential program where young women come and they learn how to do entrepreneurship. And of course we do two things. We expose them to the campus and to life on the campus, so it's a recruitment tool. But also they do a business plan competition and it, they have to apply with their business idea. So it's really fascinating to see these very young women coming up with ideas in terms of what we're going to do. We work with um, the North Carolina Minority Business Development Institute and with the Center for Creative Leadership on a women's executive series. So executive women in North Carolina have our input in terms of how they begin to grow their businesses. And in, in Greensboro, North Carolina, there are seven colleges and universities. Aggie pride. Sorry. See, no, I knew no. you were going to go there. <laughs> but, you know, but you know, there's a little school across the street that could take Aggies and stomp them. Don't, let, don't make me have to go there, Warren Ballantyne. You know, when they talk about those four young men who sat at Woolworth, see, he started, I didn't go there. When you talk about those four young men who sat at the lunch counters, who made the signs, Warren? The Bennett Bells. Uh-huh. Who okay. bagged them up, the Bennett Bells? Come on. Who Where kept was, the protests like, going, the Bennett Bells? Who, 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 on what campus was the protest terminated? Bennett College. Bennett, Bennett College. Now, when it's fairness to y'all, I know y'all are state school, and your presidents at state schools at that time could not do that, but the bad Dr. Willoughby player who was the only president in the state of North Carolina, who had enough courage to invite Dr. Martin Luther King Bennett in 1958. Um, I don't know what y'all Aggies were doing then, but um, <laughs> 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 don't start none of brother, and there won't be none. I digress. Uh, but in any case, and we, and we love our Aggie brothers. And we love our Bills. We, we had uh, some young women uh, who had just been accepted to Bennett uh, on campus yesterday, and one little girl said, oh, I can't go there because there are no boys. I said, right, go right, right there across the street. <laughs> they are boys. Too many boys. I like to keep them boys off my campus. But anyway, we love you dearly. But um, the seven colleges, we are the smallest of the seven colleges. Uh, and we, we love, we, I tell you, we're the smallest and the baddest. But we have, with the seven colleges, a tri triad, uh, our basically consortium. So we all work together. And I'm pleased to say one of the things, I serve on the Greensboro Partnership Board. And with, Greensboro is like Boston small. Mm -hmm. In other words, in terms of per capita, we've got 250,000 people. We've got um, seven colleges. So per capita, it's almost like a Boston. Um, but Bennett stomps with the big dogs in that, in that um, they were thinking about some kind of way to attract attention to our students. So they have a biscuit bill competition. And students had to figure out a biscuit, the biscuit bill could do to sort of for their creativity. And we have a finalist in the Biscuitville competition. And so we were very pleased to see our young woman come up with, I think it was a sweet potato biscuit. Hmm? Okay, whatever. I won't be eating any of that, but <laughs> but the creativity. In fact, when they brought up the idea of a, a Biscuitville competition, I was like, that is not healthy. But um, <laughs> but it's entrepreneurship. Finally, um, we have a we do a women's leadership conference annually on mm -hmm. uh, the last uh, weekend, we, last week of um, March, usually the last Thursday or the last Friday. Part of the conference is our Heights of Excellence luncheon. Dr. Dorothy Irene Height solely granted Bennett College for Women the opportunity to use her name as scholarship. Now, other people have used it since she passed, but as she said to me, you are the first that I will allow to do this. Um, anyway, at our Women's Leadership Conference this year, uh, the theme was entrepreneurship. We have a different theme every year. We've done global. We've done based on the four foci, DT down there somewhere. Oh, no, DT. There you are. Oh, down there. I thought you were over there. Okay. DT was one of our speakers, did a wonderful job. And we bring in a lot of folks who are entrepreneurial. I'll have to get you next time. Who are entrepreneurial and who share this with the students. We had 70 students who were able to come because of the corporate sponsorship that we've had and were able to um, basically rub elbows with these folks who have ideas about entrepreneurship. So I've seen students perk up more about entrepreneurship than we ever had. We made a decision as a people at a point in time 
that we'll focus more on education than on entrepreneurship. I think that historically, there was a point in time we said we want everybody to go, I still want everybody to do a college, but everybody who goes to college is not gonna go get one of those jobs the last 40 years, because they don't have those jobs anymore at all. And so the entrepreneurship piece is a piece that becomes very exciting for our people when we look at it. But I just wanna throw in, I know I'm running my mouth, but you know I do that. Um, just a reminder to us, we were the original and initial entrepreneurs. The most poignant act of entrepreneurship that exists is the act of self-emancipation. Yep. And that was when black folks purchased themselves. We bought ourselves, I don't understand that, there are three kinds of enslaved people. You have runaway slaves, you have self-purchased slaves, you have stay-at-home slaves. Um, I wasn't once Minister, Fer Minister Farrakhan told me, he said, you remind me of a runaway slave. I said, you prefer to stay at home kind? <laughs> but, uh, but I could not imagine purchasing yourself. But many people did because they were people of honor. Free Frank McWhorter, Elizabeth Keckley, who was a tailor to Abraham Lincoln, purchased herself and her son who died in the Civil War. So we were the original entrepreneurs. That is an act of entrepreneurship. And our HBCUs really must embrace that notion of entrepreneurship. It doesn't have to be as extensive as Bennett's, but there should be at least some presence for entrepreneurship on our campuses. <laughs> Finally, I think that uh, John said earlier that um, we have to look at the economic impact that HBCUs have. And I think that's very important as well because it does make a case for entrepreneurship and ways that we can uh, basically assist our communities. We did, um, I did four buildings with the help of a great team, four buildings in four years at Bennett College for Women. Um, I find that I was just thrilled that I said I was gonna do it. Brother Affleck, when I came and said, I'm gonna build, they said, the girl is nuts. Uh, how are you gonna build? And I said, we will build. But those four buildings meant that we put $21 million worth of economic development into Greensboro, North Carolina at a time when nobody was hiring. One of the things that I insisted occur is that the major contractor make sure that 50% of the subs were people of color. I'm like, no, no. and basically I said black, and then he told me I had to expand that a little. So I said, okay, fine. Um, when our subs began to do their bids, we found that many of them did not have the appropriate training to do an appropriate bid. Therefore, we set up training workshops for our subs so that we had a series of workshops so that if you were interested in submitting a bid, we would teach you how to put it together. And that's the role we play. We're not just educating our students and our faculty, but we're also having an impact on communities. And again, I think, I tell people, if you did not go to an HBCU, adopt one. And by adopt, I mean write a check. I mean, just don't adopt them theoretically, but send us a check. Let, let me ask this, because um, when I think about entrepreneurship, I totally agree with everything that's been said thus far. One of the things that, that crosses my mind, though, is, is this conversation happening in our homes with our young people? That's the first thing. I know personally I have led an initiative off of the radio with my listeners and have gotten them to put over a million dollars in North, Car in North Carolina's bank, uh, Mechanics and Farmers Bank, and they've taken that money and lend it back into the community. Uh, the, the, the third thing that I think of is, is what Dr. Uh, Ogilvy uh, deals with every day with business strategy and urban entrepreneurship. And I say that because I remember uh, being in law school and uh, I'm a partner in a law firm and, and it's five of us and we all went to law school together. We lived in law school together. Uh, I remember being in my, in my third year of law school and, and the dean of the school at the time who um, I used to work for came to me and said, look, you're about to go out and you're going to go take on the world. But remember this, in order to be a good lawyer, you must be a business person first. You must be a businessman mm -hmm. first. And I'll never forget that conversation because that conversation opened my, opened my eyes up into entrepreneurship. And he told me, you have to strategically plan this out. Well, when we went out, it was five of us. You know, we started out working in big corporations and big firms, and then we put our money together and opened up a firm. Now we have over 600 people that work for us in three different states. But it was because of that conversation of entrepreneurship of being a business person first mm -hmm. that we thought about, well, wait a minute, do we want to work for somebody else the rest of our life or do we work for ourselves? Dr. Ogilvie, you deal with this every day with young people. What, what do you tell them as they sit in your classroom about strategically planning for entrepreneurship? Thank you. Um, I want to thank Marie Johns uh, for inviting me. And we've done some work together in the past. Um, before I say anything else, um, those of you who use limousines in the uh, Washington, D.C. area, my brother has a limousine service. I come <laughs> from an entrepreneurial family, so Ogilvy Transportation. Uh, my father was an entrepreneur, my mother was an entrepreneur at Did 19. Did you get a discount? Hey, mention my name. 
<laughs> um, my sister had a, a law firm and had her own business, and my uh, uh, other brother has his own business. Entrepreneurship, I think, is probably one of the most important things we can teach our young people. And in fact, we're doing something called Lemonade Day. Is anybody familiar with Lemonade Day? A couple of people in Newark for the first time. Lemonade Day is a program where uh, kids from K to 12 learn how to be entrepreneurs in the context of developing a lemonade stand and selling lemonade. And all the attributes of, of business go into putting a lemonade stand together. Um, buying your supplies, what's the formula for your product, uh, where, who you're gonna market it to, where you're gonna locate, how you're gonna get some money to buy the supplies, you have to pay people back, you have to hire some people to help you, so all the things that go into building a business can be done in the context of a lemonade stand. And that's an important thing because our young people need to be aware of entrepreneurship as an alternative career. As Dr. Malvo mentioned, a lot of people are not gonna get these jobs that parents and grandparents perhaps had where they worked for a company for 30 years and got a gold watch or whatever. That's not happening. Mo most big companies are downsizing and shipping jobs overseas. And so a few people will have maybe good careers in the corporate world, but where you really get the bang for your intellectual capital is when you are paid directly for it and don't have to share that money with somebody else. Because if you work for somebody, they are getting more money from you than they're paying you, if you're a good worker. At Rutgers, uh, we've been very involved with entrepreneurship on uh, a number of different levels. We are the only urban entrepreneurship center in the country, and we deal specifically with urban areas across the world. So we do global entrepreneurship. We've done some, we're, we're doing work in, in China and in Australia, and we've had some other countries approach us. Uh, we do, so we do international entrepreneurship, we do urban entrepreneurship, cities, wherever they are, uh, social entrepreneurship, and many countries in the world are now looking at social entrepreneurship. And for those who don't know exactly what that means, that's not being a nonprofit and selling, you know, baked goods um, to raise money. It's being a business that's sustainable because you have a dual goal, which is to make money and to do social good. And you fuel your business through doing your social good but selling services, goods and services. Um, let me see. Uh, we have a couple of others, and I'm blanking right now. <laughs> um, we started uh, a minor in entrepreneurship for all the students on our campus, both in Newark and New Brunswick. And we did that because, as Dr. Malvo said again, if you're an artist, why should you be a starving artist? Why should you, if you're a scientist, not know what your IP is worth and get the benefit of your IP, intellectual property, intellectual capital? In any field you're gonna go into, unless you're very rich and have somebody just giving you money, you know, you have a big trust fund, you never have to work, you're gonna have to work. And even if you work for a corporation, you need to have an understanding of yourself as a product. Because in a sense, you're selling your services to that company. So we believe that entrepreneurship is a key. We've had a number of initiatives that we've done in Newark. Um, our mayor, Cory Booker, uh, is a partner with us in, a number, in the city with a number of ventures. Um, we have worked with BCDC, which is Brick City Development Corporation, an economic development arm of the city of Newark. And in that context, we have taught small businesses how to do bids and how to get bonded and have had classes so they can get bonded. Um, we have a program called the Entrepreneurship Pioneers Initiative and Jasmine Cadero, who's sitting in the back, stand up Jasmine, uh, manages that program. <laughs> and this is a fabulous program. Uh, we started this program four years ago with some money um, from the Department of Labor and subsequently got corporate support. But this is a program for first generation entrepreneurs. That means neither your mother nor your, your, your father, your grandparents, nobody in your family had a business, or at least a legal business. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you could be doing that here and not have a license. Um, but this was to teach people because they didn't have the conversation over the dinner table about, you know, I had this problem and how I dealt with it in dealing with entrepreneurial issues. This has been a fabulous program. I walked in there the first day and there was so much energy in the room as these entrepreneurs started learning some things and talking to each other. You could have lit up Newark for a month. The excitement. And in fact, unlike students who always want to do less work, these entrepreneurs wanted us to give them more and more and more. It's a nine-month training program they meet once a month. 
Um, they have classes. Uh, they get peer mentoring, they get um, single mentoring, counseling, uh, they get preparation to build a growth plan for their business. And the entrepreneurs are so excited about what they were doing, they have met every month since they graduated four years ago. So I think that says something. And we've gotten corporate support for that and we've done that program every year since. And it's a fabulous program and Jasmine's done a great job in improving the program every year. Um, that's something that can be done. Um, Cynthia Clemens, um, who you met when she stood up, and I have been talking about doing some uh, efforts together, and that's a program you could easily do in your HBCUs, working with first-generation entrepreneurs. Um, we've done a number of summits. We had the first ever White House Summit on Urban Entrepreneurship. And that was an important summit because it gave the government a perspective of entrepreneurship for other than the SBA probably most of these agencies didn't really have a clue about what it is to be small business because the government people usually deal with you know big businesses who fet them and do other things um, but those are the guys that they basically know the small business people have a whole different set of issues and the beauty of this conference was that the entrepreneurs in the audience and the educators and the other people in the audience we're able to talk about the problems that small business people have, which was important for the White House officials who were our partners in this summit. And the White House was able to tell the entrepreneurs about a host of services and programs that they have that nobody knew about. So Marie mentioned that um, she has programs for people starting businesses all the way up through the chain. A lot of people didn't know that. As a result of that conference and then uh, the summit and forums that were spread around the country to get more information to confirm the data that they got at the summit, the White House now has a portal for small businesses so that you have a one, one place to go to find out the information you need about what the White House and the various agencies have to offer. So things like that are very important. Um, we, have, um, we had the Angel Summit which was the first Black Angel Summit looking at angel capital for minority businesses. And um, my friend, Dr. Holyfield, is in the audience. Stand up. Uh, he was our partner, America 21, in that effort. And we brought people from all over the country, including if anybody saw Soledad's uh, special on um, the lack of angel capital, a lot of the people in that special were at our conference. Uh, we had, um, we have a Minority Supplier Summit coming up, where we're working with um, both the state, the city, and corporations. Because in the community, what you want to do is that you increase your multiplier. And if you can keep money in the community and have your small businesses, your medium-sized businesses doing business with the larger firms, with your college institutions, and with your government, local government, that benefits everybody in that community, because it increases the multiplier, rather than them shopping outside importing goods into the city. What you want to do is people to come, you want people to come into your city and spend their money rather than you going, your people going out and you having a net leakage. So one of the things we're working on is, is preventing uh, leakage. And we've been involved with getting the first new supermarket in New Jersey in about 40 years because people were going outside of Newark except for the small bodegas to buy their goods. So there are a lot of things you can look at, um, particularly the HBCUs, are ways to keep money in your community, to have your institution involved in creating an entrepreneurship program. I would advise every HBCU, if you don't have one, to have an entrepreneurship minor, at least, um, and perhaps an entrepreneurship major for your undergrads and for your MBAs, an entrepreneurship concentration, and as we have started at Rutgers, a PhD in entrepreneurship. Wow. So all of those things can make a difference. Wow. And if you have questions later, then please ask me. A PhD program. Dr. Uh, Jones, Dr. Ogilvie just said something that, that caught my attention. She said, you know, most of these kids aren't going to get the jobs that their grandparents have in the past. And unless you're born into a trust fund like Mitt Romney, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. <laughs> Excuse me. Unless you're born into a trust fund, you're, you're not going to have that opportunity to be able to be an entrepreneur, entrepreneur necessarily, you may think you don't have that opportunity. Let me rephrase that. What, what, what can you do to teach college students that they can be entrepreneurs even while they're in college? I know one of the things I used to do with my, my, my line brother, he cut hair on campus. All he wanted was $7 for the haircut. Everybody had to book with me. 
I charge ten dollars. I was making three dollars a head, not cutting any hair. How do you teach them how to be entrepreneurs from the beginning? Well, that may explain a lot, just right there. Um, so I would start by saying thank you for my being here as well. I think I'm a little bit of an odd man out, so let me give you a framework and a context for Mission College, and you tell me if you think I may be a fish out of water here. Mission College is in Santa Clara. We are in the heart of the Silicon Valley. So how many people in here would think Silicon Valley doesn't need entrepreneurial programs? <laughs> okay, good, I'm glad you didn't think that. Um, we have about 11,000 students, but we are an Anna Pizzi grant institution, which means we have about 53% of our students who are API, which is Asian Pacific Islanders. And one of the things that happened at Mission College, because we're in the heart of the Silicon Valley, is that we quickly learned that many of our students, because they're community college students, think of entrepreneurialism like Steve Jobs. So they are entitled and feel somewhat engaged in being the next multimillionaire but don't really understand the hard work it takes to actually be innovative and be an entrepreneur. So I'm a little bit unique in that. Let me tell you what we did. It's also different. Um, at Mission College, we decided to start a nonprofit as our solution. Uh, there were several reasons for that. I'll give you those. But our nonprofit is called MC2IT, and it stands for Mission College Center for Innovation and Technology. And you have a handout there if you'd like to see it. It's based on an NSF grant awardee that came out of Salt Lake Community College called Innova Bio. And what they did was they created entrepreneurialism and innovative projects through biotechnology. We're doing it totally through technology. One of the reasons we did it through a nonprofit was because we figured that it would be much more flexible to deal with our small businesses and large businesses because I can hire my faculty into my nonprofit, which is great because I don't necessarily have to deal with their contract. And as you know, if you go through any higher ed institutions, they go at what I affectionately call a glacial pace of change. <laughs> and oftentimes that's because of their unions and whatever else. They actually get hired on through the MC2IT as part of the process. And it's, it's given us a whole new understanding of how to help students actually get into that world. So here's what we do. We have three parts to the MC2IT. The first part is to take any small business or high tech company who's interested in doing R&D back burner projects with our students and we get them in the door as quickly as we possibly can. These are not usually the Googles, they're not usually the people like Intel in that they already have Berkeley and Stanford to work with and all of those are actually revenue generating programs in R&D. We're not interested in keeping the IP at MC2IT. What we're interested in doing is getting our students in that door to understand what it takes to be innovative and entrepreneurial. And our whole focus of our engagement has to do with prescriptive business participation. So let me tell you what that means. When they come in with a contract and when they decide that they want our students to help out with something, we put them in what we have just built, which is an incubator lab. It's a state-of-the-art 21st century lab that allows our businesses to bring in whatever technology they would like to bring in specific to the project, but it also allows them to come in and work with our students on site. What they do that's a little different and unique, other than the traditional classroom setting, is they actually begin to build the student's educational plan with them. So they go in and they say, you're great at um, software, but you can't do a presentation for your life you need to go and do some communication skills building. And they are actually part of our educational plan for all of our students, which means that it's prescriptive. And the students are automatically engaged because they're very interested in knowing what it is that these successful companies have done. So that's level one. Level two, all of our companies support and participate in our uh, staff development, professional development, we call it community development. What we have is a speaker series that happens every single month. They're all people who have started their own business in the Silicon Valley. They range from folks who just did a very small startup to someone who was an offshoot of Google and has now made his first, I think, $10 million. But they come in to talk to students and to business people alike. So everything that we do at MC2IT, they do together. 
The students are also the faculty members. They actually go to the speaker series as well. And what we found in the, that piece is they go back and they change their curriculum a lot faster because they're hearing from the businesses directly than they do because someone comes in and tells them that we need a new core value. It doesn't work as well. It's been very successful. And then part of what we do there is we have startup uh, workshops. We don't necessarily offer credit. Um, we do credit through internships, but our program's really a reverse internship. It's really about having the businesses help to run us. And I actually think that's the secret to education, folks. I think the secret to education is to be able to have our businesses begin and really tell us what it is that we need to be doing as an institution so that we can be much more flexible in how we respond. And we need to allow our students to have that flexibility as well. They come in and do the entrepreneurial program with us. They have uh, workshops that happen every single uh, weekend so that we can have not only speakers, but we can also have people from the business come in and run it. But the other piece of that is that they begin to put together what we have, which is an e-portfolio with our students. So any business that's interested in working with students on a project-based learning opportunity begins to be part of their portfolio. That portfolio gives them, goes with them to a four-year university, and it also goes with them when they're ready to do their own startup or if they're ready to work at a business. Our philosophy is that they will probably change their careers five to six times in their lifetime. Because of that, they may have their own business, they may work for somebody else, they may do anything and all of the above, but we want them to be flexible and pre-prepared. The e-portfolio goes with them for the rest of their life to whatever business that they work with. And then the last thing we have in the MC2IT is that we have our small business students run the nonprofit. So they are actually doing all the marketing, all the business planning, all of the payroll, everything, everything that we need, they do for us as part of their senior capstone. Very good eye-opener, it's an awakener for them to know what it really takes to actually start your own business and run it effectively. Dr. Jones, I hate to interrupt, they're pressing us for time. Okay, so there you go, MC2IT. If you'd like to know more about it, let me know. Let's bring on Cassius to talk about the Small Business Administration and their role. So many times, Cassius, I hear people say, I don't know where to begin. Where do I get money from? How do I start a, sm a small business? I'm sure you hear this all the time, too. All the time, and I look forward to hearing it even more. I first want to first uh, thank everyone for attending here today. This administration, this president, has taken the approach to make sure this day happened. Uh, our administrator, Karen Mills, as well as uh, particularly Deputy Administrator Marie Johns, uh, knows how important this is today by show of applause. Raise or actually clap your hands if you are working or a part of an HBCU, please. Oh. I ask you to clap because for those who didn't clap, I'm going to be speaking with you afterwards, okay? <laughs> um, just to say briefly, I'm going to say about one or two things, and we're going to turn it over, Warren, to the audience for, for questions. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a great day for me particularly. I feel like I, my, I am my own success story. Warren Short, I'm a graduate of two HBCUs, not just Morehouse Car College, but Clark Atlanta University and graduate mm -hmm. school as well. <laughs> I say that to say that, <laughs> yes, it is important to make sure that we are highlighting our HBCUs and knowing the successes that are, that are happening in place. This administration is something is phenomenal. We have young entrepreneur uh, uh, events that have taken place across the country. Uh, Deputy Administrator Johns uh, kicked off one in Charlotte, Johnson C. Smith, uh, just a couple months ago and it's been rolling every since. We had one in Atlanta and another one in Orlando. Uh, I can definitely tell you that the emphasis on HBCUs and entrepreneurship is phenomenal. This, my office has been flooded with phone calls with young folks. We've got sba.gov online. You can download an app, sba.gov, and download an app. It will put you to the closest SBA office within a 25-mile radius. So you talk about technology today. You can make, make an appointment today and make that happen. But I can say, just before we turn it over to, uh, to our audience, uh, we have uh, worked with several HBCU uh, college presidents. I can tell you particularly Dr. Dorothy Yancey at Shaw University has taken an innovative approach in making sure that the community is, is involved as well as our financial institutions. Uh, Dave Be uh, Beckley, a, a uh, president at Russ College in Holly Springs, Mississippi, has partnered with the uh, Sullivan Foundation to make sure that the curriculum is involved. And so we have people who are eager about that. Tila Spiller, I think she's in the back, has reached out to our office on several occasions to make sure that, that there is an emphasis on small business and entrepreneurship. So I just want to make sure that folks knew that. I want to also make sure this is the first time in history that our, my region, Region 4, has backed over $4 billion in loans to small business uh, uh, enthusiasts. Let me back up because some of y'all were asleep. 
Four billion. Four billion dollars right. has gone to small business initiatives. Four billion dollars. When we talk about what is this administration doing, what is SBA doing, what is uh, our uh, administration doing, four billion dollars, first time in history, it's a record. That's because people are turning their selves over to thinking about their passion. Your passion is your purpose, your purpose is your plan. You cannot build this if, you don't, if you're not passionate about it. So make sure that you're following and supporting our young folks and um, putting them in a, a position to succeed. Now I'm going to stick, take a step back and at this point in time I believe we can take some questions from the audience. So if uh, I believe we have some microphones out in the audience now. If we want to start to take some questions from some folks, Warren, back over to you. time for about two questions. Yep. Okay, let's go to this gentleman right here. He has Thank his you. hand We'll up. have time later for more, I promise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm most impressed with uh, Ms. Jones and Ms. Ogilvie's uh, assessment of what they're doing. I am at Delaware State University, mm -hmm. run the Small Business Technology Development Center, and I'm most frustrated by the fact that we are creating employees in right. colleges as opposed to employers. I run against this cultural problem that uh, universities just don't get it. And I love your ideas. And I'm curious, since you're on the extremes of our nation, how do you get the rest of the nation to follow your lead? All right. So one of the things that we did early on was to survey our employers to find out what it took to be successful in our region because we are unique in that it's a 24-7, never sleep, have to make a billion dollars in your first 24 weeks or bust kind of thing. And what we found is that to convert our students to employees, what we need to do is have something available to them from the moment they start to the moment they end that's an electronic resource of some kind, very flexible. What we're doing to convince people, I'm sorry, I feel like we're That's dating, okay. I'm so close right. to you. What, <laughs> I could do worse, huh? What we're doing, um, what we're doing to convince people is to tell them that, that the wave of the future is no longer the seamless employer-employee. It has to be that we're doing all of this together. It has to be that we're educating these students together, we're employing them together, we're giving them the resources to start their own businesses, and one of the unique things that's happening in the Silicon Valley is there are so many high-tech companies that are losing folks to their own business, they really want to keep them and actually fund them themselves for startups. So we're funneling in on that concept, and it's actually worked very, very well thus far. Um, in my situation, I've, when I went to Rutgers, um, almost immediately I got involved in doing things in the community, trying to make a difference, stay working um, with organizations, helping them get themselves together, I'm a strategy person by uh, both vocation and training before I got into academe. So I worked with a number of um, CDCs and MPOs and community organizations to help them to think more strategically about what they were doing. But a confluence of events actually um, really helped to move this forward. We had a Center for Entrepreneur Entrepreneurship when I came, but there was no decanal support. In other words, the dean didn't support it. Mm -hmm. um, the faculty person left, um, some of you may know Patty Green, who became the provost at Babson and is a professor there now. Um, so for many years, the Center for Entrepreneurship really didn't do much. And a few years ago, um, our president, I was the only minority faculty member of any type of minority for many, 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 many years wow. at the business school. Wow. Um, we did have other minority faculty on campus, but not at the business school. Uh, our president started an initiative for um, cluster hiring to increase diversity, and I wrote the first proposal. It was unanimously accepted, which was nice, and I've since hired about 10 minority faculty. Uh, around that time, um, someone contacted our dean and wanted to do something with Rutgers. Unbeknownst to me, on the, the dean said, let's meet with this guy. I, I sent an email and said, well, shouldn't we get together before we meet with the guy? You know, just don't go out and meet with the guy. The guy was on the email list, and so he contacted me, and I gave him an idea for having our MBA students vet people who would apply for funding, and they would do due diligence, and he loved the idea, and so we started that. As a result, we actually transformed the area. If anybody knows Newark, Halsey Street, we transformed that whole street because we created a, a critical mass that led to a tipping point that cascaded into a bunch of businesses coming on that street. And, um, my dean, we had a fairly new dean who was a, a business guy as opposed to an academic, 
And so he understood um, the importance of business. So all these things came together and I started my center. And I had support, you know, all up and down the university, which was quite unusual. And I had support in the city. I've been working, you know, as I said, in the city doing things. So I had support from Mayor Booker, who had me incorporate BCDC, and I'm a treasurer on that. So we work closely with that entity and work with a variety of organizations in town. We get money from some of the large corporations um, because they know um, I'll get things done if they give them to me. So we've been fortunate in that regard. So I think you create that, and then my faculty, and I, you know, because you can't do, you can't hire faculty unless faculty hire faculty. Um, so, you know, I got my department and everybody the chance when everybody was supportive, so I was able to bring in these faculty. Um, so, you know, you have to start just talking to people and let, and, and the reason it was successful because I let them see the vision and how it made a difference for them as well. So I think you have to kind of sell the sizzle as well as the steak. Let's go out to our, our last question. Hi, my name is Sharon Gibson. Um, I'm a second year graduating MBA student from Howard University. Um, and my question to you all is that what messages or what recommendations do you have for student leaders like myself to go directly back to our classmates and say that entrepreneurship really is a career option that we can pursue? Because what I'm finding is that the culture of building our own businesses is missing. Mm -hmm. So um, what, mess what recommendations do you have for myself to go back to my um, classmates? I want to jump in and mention something um, that a lot of people don't realize. When you have the opportunity to talk about starting or growing your own business and you begin it uh, with a business plan, uh, you can go to, and I'm going to re reiterate it, as you have a smartphone, download SBA.gov. Actually, she, she can put in her zip code and it'll tell yeah, you. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It will connect you to the closest one in your area. But more importantly, when you come to meet with one of our SCORE counselors or one of our SBD centers, um, they will meet with you for free. There's no charge for doing that. So as a college student or a graduate student, you know, funds can be kind of tight. The only cost that is really going to be in your position is just your time. Um, make no mistake that this is something that has been going on uh, since this administration took a very strong approach at developing our young folks. And we want to make sure that people can reach out and you can come to our office, you can sit and you can talk to us. You don't have to pay an attorney, you don't have to pay an accountant, you just have to pay the, uh, the time to come down and speak with us. 75% of the HBCUs are within my region, Region 4. The reason why I'm very passionate about that is because I've spoken to a lot of college presidents and making sure that they are telling their folks about this. So please spread the word, let them know, and to connect to SBA.gov, and you can receive our monthly newsletters, uh, newsletters as well. I would, also, yes. I would also say business schools have, you know, basically their job is to create managers, managers who hope to be CEOs. Um, <laughs> But that's a long process and you know, that's a, you know, everybody says you know, it's difficult. You know, this is a funnel. There's only one person at the top. You know, this notion that everybody's going to be CEO, it's like everybody who plays basketball is going to be in the MBA. There you go. So I think you have to talk to your fellow students and give them some examples of people who are successful business people and let them see what kind of money people make. You know, it's not just making $10 an hour. You can be making $1,000 an hour or $10,000 an hour if you have the right business. Uh, and a lot of our um, young people now, we did some surveys and, and more and more young people are thinking about going into business for themselves because they see the hip hop guys, mm -hmm. you know, they see the Google guys, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, um, all these guys. And so ask your professors to do cases around entrepreneurs. One of the um, things that we are doing on Wednesday is launching um, right there in downtown Charlotte, Innova Laboratory, which is a think tank and small business innovator. I mean, our thinking is that um, our students need to get out of the campus now and then and really, really come together with the software engineers and the, the, the IT folks and the energy, the alternative energy players in our market. And um, so this is an opportunity for us to really, really create a bridge between the university and where business actually gets done, because it's sort of happening in a vacuum, frankly, and um, where education, most business people do not want to come on campus and just sort of do a charitable workshop. They really want to engage um, and in talking real business and one of the challenges frankly is they want to know how much skin does the black college have in the game like are you willing you know they want to talk business so it's sort of like we don't want to just write a check 
what can you yeah. what can you bring? And so I really think that as we move forward, that the sort of onus is going to be on us to figure out how we have real smart discussions with the business community now that they're kind of willing to engage us. You Let's know, give this uh, panel a round of applause. I know that they're they rushing me off the stage. They're rushing me off the stage. They got another panel. That's why they're rushing me off. I know, but I want to tell them yeah, there are a couple things quickly. Barrett Harvey should stand up. He is a dean of the business school at Howard University. And uh, he has had a focus on entrepreneurship throughout. We did some work together a while back on minority business, but he's had that focus. So, young lady, just talk to your dean. Right. And Mel Stith is the dean of Syracuse standing in the back there with the uh, yellow gold tie. <laughs> No? All right, give the panel a round of applause. We got another panel coming up here now.